All right, so we're going to get started on the second half of the science component of today's, um, of today's symposium. Uh, so this talk was to be given by Dr. Rusty Holloman, who's a researcher at the UC Davis Center for Watershed Studies. Uh, Rusty started on this project while he was at SFEI, where he developed hydrodynamic models of San Francisco Bay. Um, as Meg mentioned earlier, unfortunately, due to other deliverables, Rusty cannot join us today. Uh, so my colleague, Dr. Don Yi from SFEI, um, is going to talk about the, the model that Rusty ran to show how once these microplastics get into the bay, where they go and, and how they get out into the ocean. So take it away, Don. Okay, thank you. Am I Okay, um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the transport of uh, microplastics. Uh, this work obviously done by Rusty, so I'm um, just the audiobook version. Um, he's the <laughs> ultimate author. And so all the questions you ask, um, I, I only know this deep. Uh, so. so as mentioned, I'm <laughs> the designated hitter. Uh, oh, the, the font went off, but anyway, you know. I'm um, um, the best brother called up at the last minute. So what are modeling goals? Um, well, if you're Derek Zoolander, <laughs> you have a certain set. And the, the most important being really, really, really ridiculously good looking. And for transport modeling goals, uh, we want to be really, really ridiculously accurate. But that might not be possible. Um, this is our super modeler. Rusty, and he put together these points. I think we want to link sort of the loads that was coming out of the other work uh, mentioned earlier this morning, uh, where we're looking at stormwater and wastewater to the plastics that we find in the ambient environment in the bay and the ocean. And then through that to kind of guess where these plastic particles end up. And also just to kind of understand the model itself, uh, you know, there's a saying, um, all models are wrong, uh, but some are useful. So we're trying to understand why the model acts what it, the way it does, and does that tell us anything about the model, or about the system, or about our level of knowledge? And then finally, um, that in, in turn kind of informs how we do monitoring into the future. So fate depends on a lot on whether something floats or sinks. If you've ever seen the Monty Python, well, if you're a witch, if you float, it determines your fate or not. <laughs> and other things that float, like wood or duck or a wood duck. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's other things that sink. Uh, for example, ship anchors, which end up in the sediment bed very quickly. Or perhaps uh, mobsters uh, and... Uh, <laughs> you know, CIA informants, so. <laughs> so here we're trying to determine whether particles go up or down in the water calm or, or kind of stay in the middle, kind of like scuba divers and fish that just kind of float in the middle layers. And so in order to know this, we have to know the characteristics of those particles. So a lot of things come into play, the density of the particles, how big they are or how small they are. Um, you know, how smooth and, and, and round or angular and, and kind of stringy they are. And then sort of the general categories uh, mentioned earlier this morning, fibers, fragments, spheres, and, and these different kind of categories that, that we have them. And so if we kind of combine all these things together, for any given particle, you can kind of take a guess, oh, this is a fast riser, or this is a fast sinker, or this is kind of in between, or a slow riser, slow sinker. Um, and using this data, we'll be able to get kind of um, an estimate of the rising or settling rate of each individual type of particle that we see. So these are kind of the distributions of particles that we found in the stormwater and wastewater sampling. Um, so as you notice, in the stormwater sampling, a lot of the particles that, that we found were kind of sinkers, and the wastewater was kind of more distributed throughout the range of, of floaters to sinkers. As mentioned before, the predominant uh, sinkers that we found in the stormwater were these rubbery fragments. And then in the wastewater, uh, as mentioned before, there were a lot of fibers. 
And whether they sink or float somewhat depends on their material. For example, the polyester fibers are kind of um, moderate sinkers, and conversely, the polypropylene fibers would, would be moderate floaters. So on top of sort of this vertical behavior of the particles, we attach sort of this transport model, which models how things move laterally in the bay and ocean environment. And so this is all Rusty's work, a lovely rainbow-colored uh, map. Uh, so basically, on the left side, you have the entire model domain. So they modeled sort of the Pacific Ocean out a few hundred kilometers away from San Francisco Bay, as well as in the bay. And then sort of on the right panel is kind of a, a more focused view of the bay. And th these maps are just of, of water depth. So the whitish stuff is, is basically like one meter deep. And then the deepest stuff is the deep blue ocean out there. So, so basically, uh, we introduce uh, microparticles into this model at different points. Um, four points we picked to, to represent stormwater discharge, just to kind of illustrate um, sort of the north or southward uh, inputs. Um, this is not an accurate depiction of where stormwater comes in, because there's stormwater inputs all the way up and down the east and west side, but we're just trying to characterize, you know, where things starting at the ends end up eventually. We also added in the wastewater discharges. Here we, we actually suck in all eight of the wastewater plants that we sampled, which account for, uh, as mentioned before, around 70% of the total wastewater discharge to the bay. So this is the cool part. Um, so Rusty pulled together this particle tracking thing. And right now, in that little square in the middle of Central Bay, um, we have superimposed little dots. Uh, I forgot what the number, maybe around 100 something, um, with the red ones representing floaters, uh, the green ones being kind of neutrally buoyant, and then the, the blue ones being sinkers. So this is kind of actually closer to the mouth of the bay than really most of the particles enter. Like most of the dischargers are more towards the edges or more away from the central bay. Um, so this is kind of, um, kind of like a best case scenario for exiting the bay. Um, so just watch and just be awed by the lovely colors. <laughs> so it's very cool. I think with black light and just the right kind of chemical. <laughs> So this is a, a, an animation of about 16 days of fate. And, and as you notice, a lot of it, uh, sort of the red ones, are, are ending up in sort of the coastal ocean and spreading north and south. But you'll notice pretty much the blue ones haven't really budged. They're, they're spreading through the bay, but not a lot of them are getting out of the Golden Gate. So. And this is kind of zooming out. I, at first, I was wondering why. What that little square is at? That's that's a Farallon Islands in an idealized world. <laughs> and basically, it's expanding the scale just to show the extent of transport. So so basically, you know, in in, in sort of this 16-day simulation, we're, we're getting way out there. So once it catches in with the main currents. So, so uh, here's kind of a snapshot of sort of what the distribution looks like after about 15 days uh, in the bay. If you notice, um, sort of the highest concentrations at sort of the edges, um, especially in South Bay and then some areas in North Bay, um, and then kind of fading as you, as you get out of the Golden Gate. This is kind of the same graph, but in kind of a lighter shade just to let you see stuff. Um, and then the circles represent sort of the sample points taken uh, during the dry season in the, the water cruises, as mentioned by Carolyn. Um, and you'll see that in general, qualitatively at least, uh, the patterns match. So concentrations out in the ocean of the actual samples taken are generally lower than the ones inside the bay. And there, there are areas where they're somewhat higher. So for, yeah, so for example, just in general, all the ones on the right inside the bay are, are darker or have higher concentrations than one outside of the Golden Gate. And then other patterns that we also saw in the modeling were 
kind of these, these gradients within the bay. So for example, in the north, in Susun Bay, I don't know if we can get a, um, the upper circle there, you see sort of uh, kind of a gradient, like higher concentration on sort of the south end, and then sort of fading concentrations going to the northwest. And then also in Central Bay, you, you kind of see like a, a pretty uh, high or, or higher concentration area sort of right by the, the Golden Gate and then you know, a little bit less uh, towards the eastern shore. And, you know, uh, simulation is sort of depending on the, um, the period being modeled, but in this particular case, you know, the model predicted sort of a, a northwest transport along the, the shores uh, of Tamales and, and stuff. So, so definitely stuff is getting out there and moving. So here's a map uh, similarly looking at sinking particles, looking at the counts sort of in the bottom, you know, half meter or, or so of water. Um, and again, really you have a lot higher concentrations sort of in, in South Bay and areas kind of near the shorelines and then uh, pretty much very little getting out of the Golden Gate. And again, as a reminder, um, this is somewhat a little bit of an artifact of, of where we're introducing uh, particles. So if you notice in the far north, there's a dark, dark, you know, blue spot with very high concentration. That's because that's where the model was introducing the particles. And my bet is that if we actually had it for every stormwater input, there'd be a little, you know, dark blue spot around every single one of them. Um, and, it, and this, you know, is just kind of illustrating uh, where the model sticks it in, it just kind of sticks around near those entry points. And um, I guess, uh, you know, in Diana's slide, I, I, I guess I should have shown the, the bubble plots, but again, in Diana's slides on the semi-concentrations, in general, they were lower, uh, higher concentration than the lower South Bay. And, you know, based on the coloration, you know, the model pretty much predicted that general pattern. So we had the highest abundance in lower South Bay. So what did we get out of all this modeling effort? Um, well, sort of the broad patterns in the model uh, were generally reflected in the data that we collected out in the field. So for example, uh, concentrations in general inside the bay were much higher than out in the ocean. Um, the stormwater particles were primarily sinking and they're sticking very close to where they're getting introduced, whereas the wastewater has more foiling particles, uh, which are able to get outside of the bay. Um, ultimately, uh, the fate is determined by the buoyancy, and so the buoyant particles really, you know, get out there and, and get to the marine sanctuaries and beyond, and the sinking particles pretty much stick where we uh, kind of put them into the bay. So with that, I'm done. Thanks. <laughs>
um, sort of the next generation. It's, al it's already tough enough doing that, <laughs> right? If you have like kind of an evolution of particles on top of that, you probably definitely see like a, a, a move, like kind of a, a net movement, like enter at the surface and eventually end up in the sediment. Uh, you said the model and the data uh, generally match each other. Yeah. So then, uh, how different were these specific values? Uh, or if you don't know, is okay. I yeah, I don't know. I I think um, with models, like if you're order of magnitude, you're pretty happy. <laughs> so so like a factor of two is easily. But I think you know, just I was just thinking in terms of like general colors. Like we weren't seeing like these you know bright white low concentration spots in the middle of something the model predicted would be a hot spot, right? So, so I think if, if the model at least does that, um, you're generally happy because we know that we didn't get all the stormwater inputs in, we didn't, you know, so there's a whole host of factors that aren't um, incorporated fully um, in the model and, and Rusty, I think, as of last week was, was doing a uh, model with like 40 stormwater inputs, which takes forever to run, you know, but they wanted to get something out uh, for all you guys to see, so, so this, this is what we had. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, and I should have mentioned before, all of these Presentations will be posted on the website after today, so if you're frantically scribbling everything down, know that it will be posted. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Chelsea Rockman from the University of Toronto, and Chelsea's been an integral part of this study. Um, her lab has single-handedly analyzed all of the samples that you heard about this morning. Uh, Chelsea has been studying microplastics for the past decade and is leading the charge to identify robust and standardized methods for microplastics so studies can be compared more easily around the globe. Um, today, Chelsea is going to focus on uh, the future of microplastic science. a lot of counting, me, meaning Alice and 20 plus other undergraduates, graduate students, and research technicians spent a lot of time counting tens of thousands of particles. So you can see throughout this day as the results are being rolled out, it was a big feat that there was a lot of microplastics in that those samples, uh, and that we learned a lot. Are we happy for a lot of is that hopefully the study actually leads to uh, policy change, but also what I want to talk about today is how we think the lessons learned can lead to new methods uh, that can inform the science as well as answer some of those big, ah, <laughs> gaping questions. I have a microphone on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You can still hear me. I'll try not to yell into the microphone. I have a tendency to be too loud. Okay, so I want to start, because uh, I'm not going to talk about the future of the science in general. I will talk about what are some of the big gaping questions left and where are we headed, but I'm going to focus mostly on methods, because we've learned a lot throughout this process of how we think the methods uh, may change. And so I want to start from the beginning uh, with some people in this room who really led the charge and are pioneers in this field. So that would be Marcus Erickson, who's in the audience, Anna Cummins from Five Gyres, Charlie Moore, who's not in this room, researching that or finding the discovery that plastics are in the middle of the oceans, bringing to light these garbage patches full of plastic in the middle of the oceans, realizing that it's not just about the Pacific Ocean, it's globally about the world, but really realizing that it's not just about the big stuff, right? There's not an island of plastic floating in the middle of the North Pacific gyre twice the size of Texas. There's a smog or a soup of small plastic debris everywhere. And so learning over time that it, yes, there's macroplastic and we need to clean it up and it is having an effect, but that it's leading to a big microplastic issue. And that it's not just about the garbage patch, it's about the many garbage patches. And now today we've learned a ton since this time that it's not just about the ocean, it's about terrestrial ecosystems, freshwater ecosystems, and the dust in this room. Don't breathe. 
just kidding, please do. <laughs> so since this time, we've, as I said, we've learned a lot. I used to be able to keep up with the literature in this field, and today I struggle as well as do, I think, the students in our lab, right, trying to keep up with all the tremendous effort in science that's going on around the world. And so here you can just see, if I just do a quick literature search of the term microplastics and web of science, the amount of papers that are creeping up decade after decade um, after decade. And within this body of literature, we've learned that plastic pollution in general, including the big stuff and the small stuff, is ubiquitous that it is in every level of our food chain, that it can impact wildlife, as Suzanne talked about today, um, that it is in our own species, right, that we are exposed. But what we don't yet know is a lot of other questions about how it impacts people, the processes of how it moves around, et cetera. So we have quite a lot uh, of new work to do. But I would say that we've started thinking about this contaminant differently already just based on what we've known. So in the beginning, when Richard Thompson coined the term microplastic in 2004, he was doing work in the middle of the ocean. And we were thinking about plastic as an ocean contaminant. Today, in 2019, as Suzanne mentioned, we think about microplastics as this complex contaminant. Some people are comparing it to persistent organic pollutants in that it is ubiquitous, it is persistent. We don't know yet whether it can bioaccumulate, but there is some evidence of it passing the the stomach and going into parts of the body in organisms, so suggesting that bioaccumulation may be possible, and there is evidence that it can be toxic. And so we don't quite think about this research, this contaminant the same way as we used to. We're starting to recognize it as a global contaminant. And I still think of plastic pollution in general, but I also think microplastic is a bit of its own uh, beast and its own thing, which is also separate and different from the big stuff. When we talk about it being everywhere, we've also recognized that it is in our seafood resources, it is in our sea salt, it is in our drinking water, and it is in the air that we breathe. So the World Health Organization put out a report. You saw a picture of this earlier. The media went in all kinds of directions. It causes an effect. It doesn't cause an effect. Drink more water. Drink less water. The reality is that report came out with a statement that said there's no evidence of effect, suggesting there might not be an effect. The reality is there's also no evidence of no effect. So, no, so evidence of no effect doesn't mean evidence that it doesn't matter. It means we need more science, right? And we need to do the science correctly. And so that brings us to thinking about how we think about this contaminant. I love that Suzanne put up a slide that said we need to do work to understand all the different types, the different sizes, the different shapes, and the chemicals that are associated with them. We have quite a bit of work to do to understand the complexity of this contaminant, uh, which as she said, is not all the same, right? Microplastics are not microplastics, are not microplastics. And so this complexity is something we need to realize and take into account as we think about our methods that we use to answer some of these gaping questions. So if we go back to the beginning, this is what we used to do, right? We used to drag a surface trawl, a manta net, across the surface of the ocean. On the deck of the ship, or back in the lab on the ship, or at home, we would pick with tweezers out of the sample, sometimes with just our naked eyes, and sometimes with a microscope. As we've looked smaller and smaller and smaller, we've learned we can't do this anymore. So it's not that there was a problem with the methods before and that they weren't robust. It's just that we were quantifying bigger sizes. And I still would argue that in the one to five millimeter size range, I can do a pretty good job with my naked eye or under a microscope of quantifying the microplastic. But when I get down to the nano or the small micron range, maybe below 500 micron, I start to doubt myself and I need more sophisticated methods. And so this is where in this project, turning over tens of thousands of particles, we had an awful lot of time to think about how would we change things, right, in this field. And, and it hasn't just been us. There are people all over the world thinking about how can we improve these methods and writing literature about it. And these best practices have to include how we collect the sample. So is it with a manta trawl? Maybe for fibers, we're doing bulk water sampling. These types of things, depending on our objective and our question, we need to sample appropriately. Sample preparation. How do we take the sample back in the lab and extract the microplastics? If we're in interested in dense particles, how do we separate them from a sediment? If we're interested in, in the tissues of fish, how do we digest the tissue of the fish around it? These methods are out there, but there's not a yet a standard way for each matrix, so we need to think carefully about this and understand our recovery. The sample analysis. It's no longer okay to just use your eyes for the small pieces. Analytical chemistry is necessary, whether it's FTIR, Raman, pyrolysis, GCMS, and then there's a spattering of others. 
And then data reporting is really important. How do you report it? How do you report uh, how much you have? Is it in a mass concentration or a particle concentration? And these are all things we're grappling with today in addition to QAQC. QAQC is very important. As we sit here today, if you have a glass of water in front of you, which I think you're not allowed to in this room, but if you did, it would be accumulating some of the particles from the dust in the air. And so if you were interested in the microplastics in the water from the tap, you wouldn't be able to necessarily do that because it's now being contaminated by the dust flying in it as you sit here. That same problem can happen in our lab as we sit over a sample in our polyester lab coats uh, or just in the dust in our air. So you absolutely need clean techniques, HEPA filters in the lab, clean rooms, whatever it may be, strict training protocols. Uh, Meg and Becky, and I think everyone, talked about blanks. Taking field blanks, taking lab blanks, and doing a blank subtraction like we do for analytical chemistry. What we do in our lab is we think about the different colors and morphologies of plastic like we think of different congeners of PCBs, if that means something to you, or different types of pesticides. So if we find black fibers in our field blanks, we subtract black fibers from our samples. And then taking duplicates, I don't think there's a lot of studies that have done this. This study did it. Looking at the relative uh, standard deviation between your duplicates, if you just take them one after another, is important. A spike recovery, understanding if I extract my sample, do I get out what I think I started with? Uh, chemical analysis of the particles, that goes back to FTIR or Raman confirmation, and then transparent and harmonized reporting. So we've come a long way. We have a lot to do to try to standardize these methods. Uh, Shelley Moore from Squirp is going to talk about a study that we're doing um, in Southern California to try to I answer the state water board's bill, which says we need a method to quantify microplastics in drinking water. So trying to come up with ways to do that in a robust way because it means a lot when you're telling people what they're exposed to. Okay, so I really can't stress enough that particle ID has become a critical component. This can be FTIR, this can be Raman, this is what we did in our lab for all of these samples. Um, we don't have a pyrolysis GCMS. This is something new coming online, I would say, in the field. People have been doing it for a while. People are starting to push whether how quantitative it can be. But in some ways, it's necessary. And the reality is one of these methods isn't better than the other in general. These methods are complementary. And some are better for certain shapes, sizes, or types of particles. So for example, the FTIR can be really good for those dyed fibers. And in our lab, that is as long as that fiber is big enough because the FTIR doesn't get to quite as small of particles. Raman is great for tiny things, but it struggles with black particles and it struggles with dyed particles. And so for example, for an attire, this is the Raman spectrum that we get or some of the spectra. And a lot of it just relates to the dye. So we know there's a dye in there. We know that it's black. Sometimes we just see fluorescence, a big hill, but we don't know what it is. And with pyrolysis GCMS, you can, GCMS, you can see that's styrene butadiene rubber that's in there. So this was work done by Ashok Deshpande at NOAA. Uh, we sent him basically a plate of 20 pieces of tire rubber and didn't tell him what they were, but it's pretty obvious when you look at it what it might have been. Uh, and he analyzed them, and he's still working on analyzing more for us. Size also matters. As I said, some of these techniques are better for different sizes, but the size also matters in terms of the toxicity. So this was mentioned earlier um, by Suzanne. And the thing is with the size is that it is probably important for the fate. If we are interested in whether or not a microplastic bioaccumulates or magnifies up a food web, my hypothesis is that this may only happen for the small sizes. So being in the gut is not bioaccumulation, but it going out of the gut into a bloodstream or into an organ is accumulation. If then an animal eats that animal and it also accumulates more, you can have magnification. But that's quite a big barrier, right? It has to translocate every time out of the gut into the animal. And for that to happen, it's probably only a very tiny particle. So this question of do we see biomagnification or trophic dilution, I think can only be answered related to the small stuff. And we don't have, I would argue, the right methods yet to really answer that question. But pyrolysis GCMS may help with that. When we think about toxicity to humans, if I small, swallow a big piece of plastics, I will probably excrete it, just like if your child swallows a tiny little toy, you will probably excrete it. 
But for the small stuff, we don't know. Again, we need the better methods to get to the smaller plastics. We also need to make sure that we are sampling and doing our whatever method we carry out in a way that meets our objectives. I feel strongly that we need standardized methods. I really do. I am torn between this idea of standardized, me standardized methods because I think one method can't be good for everything. So the standardized methods, I think, are really good for quantifying it to understand exposure. But I also think we have to think about what our hypotheses are and develop methods that match the question at hand. So if I'm interested in sources and pathways, I might design a study just like SFEI and Five Gyres did in order to understand what's going into the bay, where is it going, and where is it coming from. So I might design a study to analyze not necessarily the tiny stuff, but some of the bigger size fractions of microplastics. If I'm interested in the measurement of success, as we bring policies online, we absolutely should be measuring whether or not they work. So this may have to do with the policy that we implement. Right now, we're producing a lot of plastics. Those plastics are being emitted into the environment. At the UN level, they are discussing an international agreement. They are going to want to know whether those international agreements are meeting targets. Do we see a reduction in plastic emissions over time? In order to do that, we have to sample appropriately. So if, we do, if we're thinking on a, on a smaller scale, uh, so Lisa Ertel is going to talk later about a study on fibers. If you implement something like a filter in a washing machine, you want to know before and after if you see a reduction, right? It can either be at a or different questions. And then finally, risk. So earlier, Mark Gold put up a slide that had trying to understand risk assessment. Right now, we know a lot about exposure. We're slowly starting to understand more as we look smaller and smaller. We can use the adverse outcome pathway framework, for example, or other frameworks to understand risk. So we need to make sure that if we're interested in this, we're also sampling appropriately to, to uh, understand exposure to the organism or the food web that we are interested in. So I'll just leave kind of with a, why, we need the, why we need the new methods, right? So this new methodology is really important. And what are some of those big gaping questions that are left out there in the field? So I think new methods are going to be really important for mainly for three things, I think. And one is understanding the process of how microplastic moves through the environment. I was just up in the Arctic last week uh, doing mostly teaching a class, but we do research up there. In Arctic sea ice, we find a lot of microplastics per liter of ice, or per liter of water after you melt it. The question is why? They're not a huge source of microplastics to the Arctic, not the people that live there, they're small communities. It is transporting in the atmosphere, and it is transporting in the currents. And understanding how it moves in the water cycle, we need new methods to look for that smaller stuff and to understand these processes. As I said earlier, we need new methods to understand accumulation, magnification, and impacts to human health. Right at the moment, there's lots of studies saying we're exposed. There's barely anything being done to say, does it matter? <clears throat> so my last slide, I just want to leave you with what I think are some of the next big questions. Not to say that we don't have enough information to make change, because I think that we do. We know there's a lot of plastic out there. We know that the mismanagement of our waste is coming back to haunt us in ways we could have never imagined. But we also have a lot more to understand to make sure we tailor these uh, mitigation strategies to the problem at hand. So we need to understand local entry points for microplastics into the environment. Local being the key word. In San Francisco, we tried to do that, right? So now there's some information to help with that. But monitoring strategies need to be implemented all over the world locally to understand how we reduce those emissions globally. We also need to understand the largest reservoirs for the missing plastic debris. So in this study, we looked at the fate in terms of in the sediment and in the fish. Globally, we think we know how much is floating on the surface of the ocean. It's less than about 1% that goes in every year. So where's the rest? So we need better methods to understand the fate. And not just the fate of the plastic, but also the fate of the chemicals in the environment. So plastics are not just a particle. They're also a cocktail of different chemicals, some of which can be toxic. Um, Suzanne mentioned a lot about impacts. We need more work to understand the ecologically relevant impacts of microplastics, including with the addition of multiple stressors. We absolutely know that they can have an impact in laboratory studies to organisms at different levels of biological organization, but it's complex and it depends, and we have 
almost just as much evidence of a study detecting an, an effect as evidence of studies that don't detect an effect. And it matters based on the size of the plastic, the shape of the plastic, the type of the plastic, et cetera. So we have a lot of work to do. And then human health, I don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole, but I hope people who research the health of humans or medical doctors get into this field, because right now governments are asking ecotoxicologists, and personally I'm not comfortable, Suzanne, not comfortable. So we need new people to enter the field that work on this question. What I am comfortable with is helping improve methods for quantifying and characterizing the microplastics in these matrices. And this is, in addition, one of the next steps in California is helping determine these methods. This study, I think, did a lot of work at helping inform where we go uh, from here. And I think with that, I'm done. So thank you, everyone in this room. And thanks to SFBI and Five Gyres for an amazing feat. Time for a question? Yes, I talked too long. Chelsea. No, you did not. There's time for a couple of quick questions. Hold on just a second for the microphone. I was going to ask you something uh, different from this. So, you know, I guess we already know there is microplastics pretty much everywhere, right? And uh, if, you, if you think about it, the microplastics, a lot of the plastics are not, are not supposed to be degradable. They last for a long, long time, right? So in, uh, one of the things that we need to take into account that uh, whether there is um, human uh, uh, health effects or not, you are slowly, we are slowly sequestering uh, things into plastics and they're going to waste, right? So, uh, shouldn't, sh okay, shouldn't we uh, also to a certain extent shift our focus on the manufacturing of plastics and putting things into a form that cannot recycle? that is uh, taking away because we are on a planet that is we are recycling our uh, things and we use them so if you sequester uh, all these things into plastics that do not, does not degrade over time and just stays in there forget about the uh, toxicity to humans or all of these things happening now but eventually you are sequestering uh, things that we can use but and uh, putting them in a constant form that cannot be accessed later on into other things. And that's one of the uh, things that we need to focus on rather than instead of simply counting plastics and saying how much there is, yeah. but to figure out how we are sequestering our resources yeah. and putting them into a dump. Yeah. That's so it. So that gets at the systemic change, right, that is necessary. So she, you're talking about the circular economy, right? So yes, we can count microplastics all day. And even if we build a completely circular economy where every piece of plastic that's produced comes back and is recycled and we stop pulling raw resources and we reduce, for microplastics, some will still be there by using plastic, but much less, right? And so yes, what we need right now is systemic change that says we need to reduce the amount of, I mean, this is, this is not me. This is not me doing microplastic science. This is me on my soapbox, although we have been doing some models to try to figure this out. And the reality is with the trends of how much plastic is being produced, if we continue under business as usual, even if we increase our waste management by like 99%, the amount of plastic going in the ocean is not going to change. And so we absolutely need to reduce the amount that is produced. And we need to then create plastics that are recyclable or reusable that can go into a circular economy, right? And we need to pick up what's already there. So it's, it's multi, it's very complex, right? Um, but that's not the purpose of today's meeting. Maybe it is the <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, we're going to move on uh, to our last talk this morning. So our next talk will be co-presented by Dr. Rebecca Sutton from SFEI and Shelley Moore, a scientist from the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. Uh, Shelley is co-leading an effort at SCORP to standardize methods for analyzing microplastics. And Rebecca and Shelley will highlight the next steps for microplastic science and monitoring in San Francisco Bay and California. All right, thanks for that introduction. I hope you've enjoyed all this great morning of science. I just have a few short minutes to talk about the future science steps we see for San Francisco Bay. 
And to do that, I first want to introduce the Regional Monitoring Program for Water Quality in San Francisco Bay. A lot of folks in the room know about the RMP, but for those of you who don't, this is a collaborative program that's been around for over 25 years. So we've been monitoring contaminants and water quality in the Bay for many years now. And the members of the RMP are diverse. We bring a lot of folks together in the room. Members include anyone who's discharging water to the Bay. So that means stormwater agencies, wastewater agencies, ports, dredgers, industry, along with scientists like myself at San Francisco Estuary Institute and government agencies, for example, our regional water boards. So through the RMP, we all come together, we look at the data gaps that we need to make good decisions to protect Bay Health, and we come up with those data. So when it comes to microplastic, uh, the RMP has been taking a real leadership role. So the RMP, the Regional Monitoring Program, did the original study that Carolyn briefly mentioned in her talk back in uh, 2015, published in 2016. And that's, that really opened our eyes to this class of contaminants and led to this future work, or this current work that we're talking about today. Uh, in 2017, the RMP established a science strategy to, to focus work on the Bay and prioritize the essential studies, and that's actually what guided a lot of the work you saw today. You can find uh, the earlier study, that strategy, and uh, the report from today's, that, that you just heard about today, uh, at this website. It's the symposium website. And in a week, you're going to also see a strategy update that takes into account all this great science and lays out the next few steps for our Bay Area, our priorities. So when it comes to microplastics, uh, the regional monitoring program, based on all this great work, now sees a higher priority for continued investigation here in the Bay. Uh, so we use a risk-based approach when we think about contaminants in the Bay, and that's because we need to prioritize our resources on the things that are most risky for our wildlife. And when we take this approach and we look at this very complex class of contaminants, we see many factors to evaluate. We see that it's really widely detected. We've seen that here today. Uh, we've also heard today that the impacts are uncertain. And uh, as Suzanne and Chelsea mentioned, uh, there is such a complexity when it comes to this class. The impacts, the potential impacts, can be modified by the size of the particle, the shape of the particle, its chemical composition, and then the species. The different species can have different sensitivities. So unfortunately, we don't see that this uncertainty is going to end anytime soon. Nevertheless, production is increasing. Chelsea had that great uh, figure. Uh, extremely persistent. So once we've made it, it's getting out into the environment and it's accumulating there. And it's extremely difficult to clean up. Now, when the European Union analyzed these same factors, uh, they proposed considering microplastics to be a non-threshold contaminant. So uh, Suzanne mentioned this earlier today. Their proposal is that basically there's no safe level to discharge to the environment. So when the regional monitoring program sees all these different factors, we see the weight of the evidence suggests we continue doing work, doing more science here in the Bay. So what is the regional monitoring program doing? We've got a study ongoing now on mussels and clams, clams in the Bay. So these are filter feeders, right? So as they're filtering all that water, you could imagine they're taking up microplastics too. And we collected these samples, we sent them to Chelsea's lab, and we've already started to get the data back it does look like there are microplastics in our mussels and clams. So very similar to the prey fish, right, that Diana presented earlier. So we'll be uh, reporting on these findings soon. Now a brand new study that we're just launching is to gain a better understanding of this urban stormwater pathway. So I think you guys got that big point uh, from this morning that this is a pathway that hasn't been analyzed previously, and it looks like it can really contribute a lot of particles to our bay. And so we want to develop our conceptual understanding of how these microplastics get into stormwater. What are the sources? Where is it coming from? What are the landscape attributes or the land uses that are leading to higher levels in urban stormwater? And as we build this conceptual understanding, that can lay steps for uh, future work. What we would anticipate would be a higher priority for future work, which would include testing that understanding doing some monitoring to see if we can predict where we would see microplastics. And if we can 
understand microplastics better in urban stormwater, then we can target solutions. Now, another uh, focus that we would anticipate would be really valuable for future work, work would be continue, continued study of green stormwater infrastructure. So this is that same, that LID, low impact development. It's the rain gardens, right? We have one study from SFEI they really examined uh, a small rain garden and saw it was very effective at removing microplastics. But we need some more studies. We need uh, different types of infrastructure, different sizes. How can we get the full range of, of effectiveness of this type of approach uh, in order to help uh, implement these kinds of nature-based landscaping solutions so that they're cleaning up regulated contaminants as well as our microplastics? And then finally, Chelsea mentioned this, tracking trends. So we're, we've already implemented a number of uh, sort of plastic pollution solutions in the Bay Area and the state, you know, our plastic bag ban, for example. Are these solutions working? Are future solutions working as we anticipate? Or do we uh, not see the reductions we want to see and therefore need to think uh, about more solutions to implement? So this is uh, how, what the future uh, priorities that the regional monitoring program would suggest for our Bay Area. Now, uh, Shelly's going to talk about uh, a more uh, state, a broader effort to standardize methods. All right, so you've heard all day today basically that there's been a lot of traction around looking at microplastics in the environment. As a matter of fact, there was two recent bills at the end of last year that were passed, SB um, 1263. You heard Mark uh, mention that um, the o Ocean Protection Council needs to develop a microplastic strategy. Um, there's also SB 1422. Chelsea mentioned that. There's got, there's, there, the State Water Board is required to come up with some standardized methods uh, for looking at microplastics in drinking water specifically. Um, you saw Chelsea's all, graph also of the explosion of papers that have taken, um, taken off in, the, in recent times. And the most important thing with all those papers is making sure that everybody has numbers that are comparable. Um, right now, all types of methods are being used, so there's a lot of standardization that, that needs to be um, done. Um, we were approached... Uh, uh, late last year um, by some folks that were interested in holding a microplastics workshop. The microplastics workshop was held in Southern California, but it was co-sponsored by uh, Chelsea and the University of Toronto and Ariba Scientific along with Squirp. The goal of that workshop was basically to get all the experts together in all of the methods and talk about where the state of the science was. Not only that, but we we'll share it with stakeholders, such as the drinking water folks with the State Water Board, um, wastewater uh, industry folks, um, uh, stormwater folks, all kinds of different stakeholders. Um, so, so that was the goal of that workshop. In addition, we wanted to come up with a study plan for standardizing methods. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. We have basically two parts to the study. Um, moving forward, and the first part is, is the core part of the study. How well do the different methods compare to one another? Is somebody in the same lab measuring the same thing as somebody else in, in, in that lab? Are they, are they measuring it different from somebody in a different lab? How, how close to the known number of microplastics that are in that sample are people coming to? So basically our study, we're going to create some blind samples we're going to send them out off to the labs, and they're going to have pe folks analyze them, and we're going to get a lot of information back. We also want to know how expensive it is, because if these are going to be standardized methods for everybody to use, maybe not everybody can afford to use the same method. So some of our details, we've got more than 20 labs participating. Um, we've got um, four different matrices that we're looking at. So we're going from something relatively clean to something that would be considered dirty or hard to extract microplastics from, such as sediment or fish tissue. And we've got five different methods. You saw uh, Chelsea put up a, a slide of some of the different methods. The methods range from something as simplistic as a stereoscope, where you're identifying things that look like microplastic and counting them, um, all the way up to a Raman or a pyrolysis GCMS, where you're actually identifying the polymer type. 
So the samples we're creating are going to have a known amount of plastics. They'll be known to the people creating the samples, and we'll be sending those off to those who will be analyzing the samples, and we're going to see what, what happens. Um, we've got different size ranges. Um, we've got different shapes. Um, we know that pellets and fibers are both important. Uh, you saw that from the San Francisco um, uh, study. And we're going to include false positives. One of the things, things that came out of uh, the San Francisco study that Chelsea talked about were coming up with uh, standard operating procedures for lab, labs to, fo to follow. So everybody's going to be given a set of standard opera operating procedures to follow for working up these samples. But what a great opportunity this is to also look at some different types of study augmentations. What happens if you change something up? How does that affect the number of microplastics you might count in a sample? So these are some of the, the um, uh, augmentations that we're looking at doing, where we maybe vary the matrix a little bit, uh, different uh, sediment sizes, um, maybe uh, looking at automating some of the, the analysis along the way. How does that compare with um, just following the standard operating procedure? So we're, get, we're, we're taking that opportunity to, to do some study augmentations. So here's the deal. With the State Water Board, they've got to come up with standardized methods for drinking water within two years. The clock has already started to tick, and because of that, we have a very aggressive schedule for this study. Um, we're planning on distributing the sample, samples in uh, October, November time range. All of the labs have agreed to process those within three to four months, get, them, get, them, get the results back to us, and we're looking to hold another workshop in June of next year to talk about the results from the study. So please uh, take a look at the SCORP website. You can, you can uh, see the schedule there. You can get updates from that. Um, or you can uh, contact myself or Steve Weisberg, our executive director here is here in the audience, um, and you can talk to him as well. So thank you. So if you have questions for Shelley or Becky, please find them at lunch. Um, so lunch will be in the lobby. There are some tables set up in the room next door as well as at the back. Um, where the coffee was. There are some themed tables to spark conversation around policy, science, and communication. And please be back here by 1 p.m. for the uh, solutions session. <laughs>